Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is April 9th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone is doing well today. A few stories that I'd like to discuss today have to do with an update with Brexit. Attorney General William Barr, his testimony today. And tariffs, not related to U.S.-China, but rather now the United States and the European Union. So let's kick it off with Brexit. So as a follow-up to yesterday, today, Theresa May met Angela Merkel of Germany and Emmanuel Macron of France in their respective countries. So she's flying all over the place. She's in Germany, then she's in France. She's going back and forth. Why? I don't know. She has to beg for forgiveness. She has to beg for yet another extension because she and Parliament, this does not lay entirely at the feet of Theresa May. This is her fault. This is the fault of the politicians of the British Parliament for not getting a deal wrapped up. We're talking three years here, people. Three years. Where does it leave us? So she's flying all over Europe to bow to her masters in the European Union to say we need another extension. Because it's April 9th. They have until April 12th to get something solidified. Well, they don't have it. They don't have it. She went before the European Union to ask for an extension a couple weeks ago, trying to get it out all the way to June 30th. The EU said, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. We have parliamentary elections coming up. We will move your deadline. We will extend it, but we're going to go to May 23rd. Or, I'm sorry, May 22nd, because on May 23rd is when the elections occur. So they don't want all of the shenanigans taking place in these elections. Well, there still wasn't a last-minute deal made. So now Theresa May is going back. Now the EU is scratching their heads. Oh, my goodness, these people can't get anything done. What are we going to do? Well, we might have an extension that goes out maybe, maybe till December, and maybe an entire year till next March. We don't know yet. We still don't know. There could still be hypothetically, and not even hypothetically, in reality, there could be a no-Brexit, a no-deal Brexit, come April 12th. That's still a possibility. Highly unlikely, but it's still a possibility. An extension to May 22nd, and now she's begging for a further extension. And here's the thing, guys. You have to keep this in mind with these elections, the European parliamentary elections. They don't want this type of shenanigans taking place because you're going to have a whole host of members from Great Britain, from the UK, going into the European Parliament being complete Eurosceptics, which simply means they want the Brexit to occur. They want the Brexit to occur. Now we're told if there is an extension that's going to be granted, strings are going to be attached. And that means the British people will be allowed to partake in these elections, these European parliamentary elections, but they cannot interfere with budget decisions. They cannot interfere with a whole host of issues. A whole host of issues. Again, that is the very reason why the British people voted to leave back in 2016. They did not want to bow. They did not want to answer to European bureaucrats. They wanted to chart their own course. They wanted to put their representatives into British Parliament and say, we, the people, will make these decisions, not bureaucrats, not politicians in the EU. Makes sense to me. Makes complete sense to me. Yet, nevertheless, there were people who wanted to remain in the EU, and I get that. I do. I understand it. But they lost. They lost the vote. Now it's the duty. Now it's the obligation. It is incumbent upon the politicians of the UK to get this done. It doesn't have to be pretty. We, nobody should have ever expected this to be pretty. It's a whole bunch of politicians getting together or trying to get together to get a deal struck. It was never going to be easy. It was never going to be pretty. I mean, pull up your big boy pants and get used to it. This is no surprise. Everybody wants to throw a hissy fit. Well, it's difficult. Oh, it's difficult. It's hard. What are we going to do? So we got to vote again until the people vote the way we want, because you have to remember, most members of parliament voted to remain. They didn't want the Brexit. So now you have a whole bunch of people who voted to remain, 
negotiating a deal to leave. Conflict of interest, anybody? Maybe just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. So what's going to happen? Nobody knows. Nobody honestly knows. All I know is if, if this thing gets put to a second referendum, or if this extension is truly another year, because if they give an extension out to another year, you know it's going to be another year. They're going to use the whole time. They're not going to get it done before then. They're going to wait till the whole time. Another general election in the UK. A whole host of other things is going to take place. A whole host of other things. Now, if any of that happens, I am praying and I am telling the people in the UK, you must revolt. You must revolt because that is an insult to your vote. It is an insult to your voice. It is an insult to the institution of democracy. Things are hard. It's just how it is. That's life. Again, some perspective. You got through World War I. You got through World War II. You got through a whole host of other issues, politically, economically, domestically, internationally. You'll get through this. You want to continue trading with these people? You can continue trading with these people. You're a huge economy. You're a major economy. You are one of the, if not the largest, financial centers in the entire world. People aren't just going to say, ha, well, they're gone. Now we're not going to do any business with them. That's nonsense. It's a bunch of fear mongering. That's all it is. Again, that's done. That's a coordinated effort because people in the European Union don't want this thing to go swimmingly well. They don't want it to happen. Because then everybody else is going to scratch their head and say, well, I'm giving all this money. I'm giving up my sovereignty to a whole bunch of bureaucrats and politicians in the European Union. They don't speak my language. They don't have my history, my culture at heart. You know, maybe we should leave. No, that's why they want this thing to be as bumpy as possible. This makes sense. Now, why Theresa May is flying all over God's creation is beyond me. She should be at home, 10 Downing Street, negotiating. Because remember, she's supposed to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, she's supposed to now be sitting down with Jeremy Corbyn of the Labor Party to get a deal done. Well, where is he? What's going on? Not that I'm advocating that he's going to solve this problem. In fact, I don't think he's going to at all. But that was the deal. Now you're supposed to sit down and get something. This grand plan. Well, you got two days to get it done. I don't think they're going to make it. The EU doesn't think they're going to make it. That's why they're saying, well, June 30th, if we go back to that, that's not going to be enough either. Now we might have to go to the end of December. Or we might have to go to March of 2020. That's where we are. Just leave. Just leave. For the sake of the will of the people, for the sake of the vote, just leave. I promise you, you will be fine. Will it be a little bumpy? Yeah, it will be. So is everything else. Everything else is bumpy. Is it always smooth sailing? No, it rarely ever is. So buckle up and get used to it. Just leave. Because all of this uncertainty, all of this lingering, it just prolongs the agony. That's all it does. Man up and get it done. Now... Across the pond, back to our side of things. We have the president now wanting to levy $11 billion worth of tariffs on food and wine from the European Union. Okay? Here's what he tweeted out earlier today. The World Trade Organization finds that the European Union subsidies to Airbus has adversely impacted the United States, which will now put tariffs on $11 billion of EU products. The EU has taken advantage of the U.S. on trade for many years. It will soon stop. That's the tweet from President Donald Trump earlier today. Okay, look, all of this shenanigans back and forth with all of these subsidies. Who gets them? You know who gets subsidies in this country? A lot of people do. A lot of people get individuals get subsidies through wealth transfer payments, welfare, food stamps, a whole host of things, Medicare payments, Social Security Transfer payments. Farmers get subsidies. Big energy companies get subsidies. Boeing gets subsidies because Airbus is the big rival. They're the European rival. Basically, those are the two powerhouses in aerospace. Manufacturing airplanes is Airbus on the European side. Boeing here in the U.S. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, this is just a game. It's just back and forth. Everybody subsidizes everybody. Shouldn't happen. It's not the way it's supposed to work. But that's the world in which we live. So now, I think this is somewhat of a distraction, too. Not that you can't fight two trade wars on two separate fronts. You know, you definitely can. 
but things aren't going swimmingly well with U.S.-China trade talks. So now, don't look over there because things aren't going great. Look over here now to the U.S.-EU trade negotiations because these bad boy tariffs have just been smacked on them. So how long is this going to wait until, well, now we got the negotiators at the table getting ready for a slick deal. How long is that going to be drawn out? Because which deal is going to be better, folks? Because we've been told for months now that the U.S.-China trade deal was going to be the best thing ever. It was going to be historic, remarkable, the best in history. Well, now we're going to be negotiating, I would assume at some point here, a trade deal between the United States and the EU. So is that going to take, is that going to play second fiddle? Is that going to take back seat? Or is that going to be the best deal ever? I'm getting confused. Because you can really only have one best, right? I mean, that's sort of how that works. You know, is there going to be some other good deals? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But that's just the thing. It could be a distraction. It could be something that's uh, rather serious. I don't think it's rather serious. This is just games that politicians are playing right now. This is just show us something shiny that's going to get our attention and distract us from what's really going on. In this instance, I really don't think that the U.S.-China trade talks are going that well. And remember, the Chinese have until 2025 to get into compliance. President Trump, even if he wins re-election, will not be president in 2025. So are the Chinese going to make good? I mean, they can just wade this thing out and say, well, now we got another sucker in there after the fact, and we're just going to walk all over him or her. Or we're going to go back to the drawing board, square one. I mean, what are gonna, what's going to be the enforcement mechanism? Who's really going to follow up on this? This is serious stuff. have to pay attention to it. So I think this is ultimately a, a distraction, 11 billion in tariffs, and I'm sure we're going to hear the president say, the, you know, now we're collecting billions and billions of dollars from the Europeans into the U.S. Treasury. Oh, aren't tariffs a wonderful thing? They can be from a negotiating standpoint, but so far we're not winning. We're not winning because you have data to look at. It's called trade data, and if you're winning, you would assume that those trade deficits would be shrinking, but they're not. They're some of the largest in the history of this country. So if we're winning, it doesn't feel like we're winning, it doesn't look like we're winning, and it doesn't look like there's any reversal taking place as we stand here today. Now, Moving on, because I'm sure we'll have other topics to discuss on the uh, tariffs, whether it's with U.S. and China, whether it's with the EU or some other country that gets thrown into the mix because, you know, we have to distract everybody because everything isn't going as well as we originally thought. So now to Attorney General William Barr and his testimony today. We do expect to have a redacted version of the Bob Mueller report to be released within a week, within a week. Is that really going to be seven days, five days? Who knows? We're talking government here. It could be 10 days. But I do imagine within 10 days, within a couple work weeks, it will be released. A redacted version. Now, of course, you have some of the hissy fit crybaby Democrats already out saying some things. One such as our old buddy and pal Jerry Nadler of New York, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, coming out and saying, I presume we're going to get the redacted report within a week. When we do so, if we don't get everything, we will issue a subpoena and go to court. So already before the thing has even been released, Jerry Nadler, a prominent Democrat, one who is most definitely very vocal and leading the charge on further investigations of President Trump, his family, his organizations, his campaign, his White House, yada, 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 is already ready to go with this. If he doesn't get the whole report. He wants everything. He knows perfectly well that he is not likely going to get everything because of law. It's just the precedent. It's just the statutes that exist within the Department of Justice, the Department of Justice when it comes to grand jury information, when it comes to sources and methods. You know, there's just a whole bunch of things that need to be considered here. The Democrats just want to prolong this as much as possible because they know they're running out of rope. They know they're running out of rope. They're running out of the end of the road. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. It really is. It, it's sickening. It's frustrating to talk about it all the time. But this is what's making the news. This is what these people are doing. And again, this is to distract us from the important issues in this country. You don't even hear about the important issues when you follow some of these town halls with the 2020 
candidates on the Democrat side. You don't even have a lot of discussion from the president himself or his administration talking about the major points that need to be discussed, which we have those conversations here all the time. I bring them up to you guys all the time because these things are distractions. We know there's no Trump-Russian collusion. We knew this. We knew this. We weren't having a hissy fit when Bob Mueller's report came out and Attorney General Bill Barr issued his summary saying there was no there there. There was nothing. There was no collusion. There was no obstruction of justice. We knew this. The Democrats threw a hissy fit. The mainstream media threw a hissy fit. And as a result, their ratings have tanked because everybody who was drinking that Kool-Aid and was really hoping that Trump was going down, that he was going to be impeached or that he was going to jail or his family was going to jail, well, well bunch of nothing. It was a bunch of nothing. It was a huge nothing burger, as they say. And so there was major disappointment, and now they have big distrust with the media. And, of course, that falls right into Donald Trump saying fake media, fake news, fake news, fake news. I mean, he played that hand perfectly. Nevertheless, that's even scary to say fake news because he's called things out that have not been fake news. So it's a slippery slope. It's a very slippery slope. Again, you're out there working 40, 50 hours a week. You come home, you want to turn on the news, catch up, see what's going on. Maybe you prefer MSNBC, CNN, whatever, and they're telling you, we got him. We got him dead to rights. He's going down. Just wait. Just be patient. Bob Mueller is a righteous man, can do no wrong. He hasn't been obstructed with. The president has not fired him. He's there. He has money. Nobody's messing with him. Rod Rosenstein is overseeing everything. He's his buddy, his pal. Jim Comey's an outstanding guy, of course, depending on the day. This is what you're told. This is what they were sold. This is what they believed. Then you have the report come out, the summary come out. No, nope, no, nope, nothing there. Major disappointment. Major disappointment. It's a major disappointment that the mainstream media has to play these games. It shows you that there is a lot of truth in this fake news mantra. And that's a shame. Because you're supposed to trust the media. You're supposed to put your faith in these people to give you the truth, just to report the news. Half the country knew there was nothing there. The other half believed and wanted something to be there. The mainstream media knew perfectly well that this was what was going to come out of this. Or they are beyond the pale incompetent. Because I am not a journalist, and I knew this stuff just by reading other, ar uh, other articles, following some other stations, just listening. And saying, wait a minute here, you're telling me this whole Steele dossier, which kickstarted this whole investigation, was funded for by Hillary Clinton in the DNC and was given to Fusion GPS, a political opposition research firm, and they found this guy, Christopher Steele, a former UK spy with ties to the Kremlin. At least that's the story we're told. Because as more and more comes out, we're saying, well, maybe Christopher Steele didn't even write this thing. They just wanted to give his name to it. It's the Steele dossier. Ooh, spy novel. In theaters near you. I mean, that's all this is. That's all this is. This is a script. Because more and more information comes out that maybe it was just Fusion GPS that wrote this steel dossier, the majority thereof. They just needed a guy in the middle for their plot. They needed a main star of this, of this film. Christopher Steele, former spy, Kremlin ties. And he said, sure, I'll do it. You can put my name on it. Just pay me. And he got paid. He also got paid, I think, by the FBI because he was an informant. Can't make this stuff up. Truth is stranger than fiction. So when you have those facts to look at, you now start scratching your head and say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. This is politically motivated, yet somehow, coincidentally, we're supposed to believe that President Trump, then candidate Trump, and his family, his campaign, members thereof, are puppets for Vladimir Putin and the Russian government? Hmm, something maybe doesn't quite seem as plausible now because this was a whole bunch of political shenanigans taking place from the Democrats. And the Democrats know this. Jerry Nather knows this. Chuck and Nancy know this. Adam Schiff know this. Maxine Waters, Impeach 45 knows this. Elijah Cummings knows this. They all know it. They're running out of road. It's panic. It's chaos now. They're trying to stretch this thing out as long as possible. That's why I told you fireworks, I hope, are coming. And again, this is going to be the only thing that really saves this president, is if he shows there is not a two-tier justice system that exists within this country. He declassifies information. He declassifies documents. And then we have the, the Office of Inspectors General reports that come out that look into this. 
And from that, hopefully names are dropped. And hopefully we can get to the bottom of this and hopefully people are charged criminally. Criminally. Because some of this is downright treasonous. There was most definitely a coup staged against this president. Look at the Obama administration, their FBI, their DOJ, the shenanigans that they partook in. I mean, we, I read to you guys here Lisa Page, the former uh, lawyer within the FBI, who was there during the Clinton email scandal investigation and the beginnings of the Trump-Russia collusion investigation. I read you that transcript of her testimony behind closed doors because that was recently released. We know these people didn't know what they were doing. Just listen to their answers. Listen to what they did. You throw the book at Hillary Clinton. Oh, yeah, she's guilty of X, Y, Z. Actually, A to Z, but last sentence, we're not going to prosecute her. I mean, come on. And then they belittle it and say, well, that was nothing, even though we had all of this evidence. And then you have nothing on Trump-Russian collusion. But that, that's really serious, guys. That's, that's the really serious thing. Because we have this document that was funded for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. That's the reality of it. And now here's the sick thing that's going to happen, if it happens, and again, I hope it does, with the declassification of all of this information. Names, I hope, to be dropped by the inspector's general reports. And then don't forget, hopefully there's still a Clinton Foundation investigation underway by U.S. Attorney John Huber out of Utah. So all of that stuff coming together, hopefully we see some hedge roll. Hopefully we see these people have their day in court. And again, everybody is innocent until proven guilty. But there's a lot of fishy stuff going on here. Something's amiss. Something is amiss. And if you're going to go after President Trump and a whole bunch of people associated with his companies and his campaign, well then, if justice is blind, then you have to go after against Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton and the Clinton Foundation and a whole host of other Democrats, the President Obama himself and some of his closest advisors and members of his cabinet. I mean, this is what you have to do. Otherwise, there is a two-tier justice system. And that cannot stand in the United States of America. So that's where we are. So while we continuously have this three-ring circus, while you continuously are going to hear on this program and on every other news network out there, and you're going to see the faces of Jerry Nadler, Chuck and Nancy, Adam Schiff, all of these scumbags out there saying, look, we got to continue to investigate this president. we just got to continue, continue, continue. This is what we're going to have. Until, and unless and until the president declassifies information. That's the only thing that's going to play this, because if there's a true Trump card, well, then a true Trump card, boom, that's it. It's over. It's game over. But again, the sick thing is going to be, there's going to be half of this population in this country, despite staring it right in the face that the Democrats, the Obama administration, a whole host of other people abused their power and authority, broke the law in many cases, they're not going to believe it. It'll be written in black and white. It'll come from bipartisan investigators. Won't make any difference because that's how divisive we are in this country. People, pe their heads will explode. Those people who actually say, oh my goodness, that was true, their heads will explode. I mean, that's what's going to happen because they're not going to see this coming. They're not ready for it because they've been listening to Anderson Cooper, Don Lemon, and Rachel Maddow who've been saying, we got Trump. No, you don't. So now when it's going to do a jujitsu move, it's going to be a 180, and now it's all the Democrats going down, their heads are going to explode. So we're going to have fireworks and heads exploding. I mean, this is unbelievable. This is the United States in 2019 and in 2020. Buckle up. Thank you so much for joining me today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a pleasure having you. As always, please like, share, subscribe, get the word out. Leave your comments. I'd love to hear from you. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.